because when the yen got too expensive, that created a panic. But if the dollar gets too expensive, we're talking about a bigger banking crisis in my mind than 2008. This is Kaiser Johnson with Liberty and Finance, and these are the Miles Franklin Weekly Specials for August 13th through August 19th, 2024, while supplies last. First, we feature the famous one ounce gold Krugerrand at just $60 over spot. Next, we have the favorite bullion coin of Europe, backdated silver philharmonics at just $3.10 over spot. And finally, we have one ounce platinum Canadian maples at only $80 over spot, one of the lowest premiums on platinum we've seen in a long time. To order our specials or any of the many other options we have available, call us at 1-888-81-LIBERTY. That's 1-888-815-4237. We're available after hours and on weekends, and we look forward to speaking with you. Welcome back to Liberty and Finance. We're delighted to have this returning guest, Matthew Piepenberg is a partner at Von Greyers, headquartered in Switzerland. He joins us today, Monday, August 12th, 2024. Matthew, thank you for coming back on Liberty and Finance. That's always a pleasure. Looking forward to speaking with you. You are widely followed by many who appreciate your seasoned and level-headed approach to understanding what's going on in our financial lives. and. Uh, uh, we are among those. I'm I'm one of your fans, as are m most of our viewers and subscribers. So we're grateful for your presence here with us. Wanted to circle back with you since you uh, are overseas from the U.S. and have a European base to give us a more global perspective on something that happened that if that could have brought down the Western financial edifice last week. We had a very big ripple in the world markets, not just in the US, but around the world markets. Some of them dropped more than they've ever dropped in a day. And they seem to be related to a underlying trigger. People pointed their finger at the uh, event of the unwinding of the Japanese yen carry trade, as it's called, where people, uh, traders had been profiting on difference in yields between borrowing yen and, and investing in US treasuries, that sort of thing that had been going on for a long time. And uh, with the Bank of Japan reversing course, uh, that was getting unwound. We've interviewed others who have expressed doubt that this is the last of those shocks because they said something that took, you know, decade or decades to put in place can't be unwound in three days. And also uh, that the that there's more to the story than this because our entire financial Western world is has a house of cards of derivatives built on top of all the underlying assets and their relationships so that it can magnify and multiply almost unimaginably the impacts of that so that what even even the small perturbations can end up having huge repercussions you've talked to us in the past about a multiplicity of risks to our existing financial uh, bubble that we are in of multiple kinds and uh, wanted to get your take on this latest uh, market perturbation of the market uh, crashes around the world that were simultaneously happening a week ago and what your takeaway is from this and what you think uh, people need to be aware of going forward to position themselves correctly yeah sure i mean you know, the fancy lads call it a liquidity crisis and the Japanese carry trade unwind uh, was a liquidity crisis. Um, as you explained very well in simple terms, you know, Wall Street and the, the world markets are making the assumption that you could use Japan as a prop desk to get leverage or arbitrage and in, in leverage uh, rates and currencies. So you could borrow in yen, lever that and buy stocks on the S&P, pretty much tech tech stocks primarily. So you could use much lower interest rates in Japan to do a carry trade in the Western markets or Australian markets, primarily the US markets. And that was a very good play as long as two assumptions were always true, that the yen would stay low, that rates would stay low, and that tech would stay high. And what happened last week, of course, was an unwinding of that. Japan's uh, central bank raised their uh, interest rates by 15 bips in uh, in August on the and then they had done a smaller rate hike as well in March but the combination of that very small rate hike just upset the table for that whole carry trade and we saw what happened two largest Japanese banks lost 10 or 11 to 15 percent overnight the Japanese yen went up 10 percent we saw the Nikkei 225 lose its greatest over 4500 points the worst loss in its history just one day the Nikkei futures tanked, Bitcoin tanked, like a tech stock, like a levered tech stock, AI semis tanked. So we saw this ripple effect in global markets from what happened was a small interest rate hike in Japan. 
I think the larger story is bigger than the carry trade. It, you, were, you were hinting at this. This is really, as I've said many times, a global debt balloon approaching you know, $350 trillion to $400 trillion in the next five to 10 years is going to go to 400 But you've got a global debt balloon with so many needles pointing at it. And those needles all affect liquidity. And, they all, and liquidity, anyone familiar, and, and your viewers, I'm sure, anyone familiar with markets, every market crash is a, is a liquidity crisis at the end of the day. There's not enough oil in the engine and the engine starts to smoke and hiss and, and pull over and crash on the side of the road. And what we saw in a lot of ways, you know, we talk about liquidity through quantitative easing or money printing or their backdoor, I call it backdoor QE through supplementary leverage ratios or the repo markets, the reverse repo markets or the BTFP program or Freddie Mac offering more leverage or the, you know, these mechanizations, the Treasury General account. There's, we're always looking for liquidity to keep this broken car running, to keep a little more oil in the engine. Obviously, direct QE is certainly liquidity. In a lot of ways, Japan was a source of liquidity for the markets. And when they raised rates, what would seem an infinitesimal amount, 15 basis points, that was enough to send the markets into a panic. And then, of course, the next day, like in 87, when we had a crisis, uh, the flash crash, like 87, you had a terrible Monday and a wonderful Tuesday because in 87, Greenspan immediately said, we're going to cut rates. And in, and in this case, Japan says we're going to walk back that little rate hike. So there was a pause and a, and a sigh of relief, and there was this huge crash and then rebound. But that really is short-sighted if you think that's a solution, because what the Japanese carry trade showed us is just how thirsty for oil the global engine is, how little liquidity there, there is. And the Japanese carry trade, I think you're absolutely right, though, Dunnigan, because this derivative market and the derivative thinking or the lack of derivative thinking, but the risks in the trillion dollar plus derivative market outside of the US markets is, I think, the bigger carry trade. Because when the yen got too expensive, that created a panic. But if the dollar gets too expensive, we're talking about a bigger banking crisis, in my mind, than 2008. And I'll explain that because in 2008, your viewers remember the two big to fail banks over their skis and debt and, and leverage with mortgage-backed securities and toxic real estate assets bundled together and tranched together. And those unwound and we had a liquidity crisis in 2008 through the US banks, the, the great too big to fail, smartest guys in the room banks. What, what many people need to understand is there is a whole other banking system outside of Wall Street and that's like Credit Suisse or HSBC or Dresdner Bank or Deutsche Bank or UBS. It's called the euro dollar trade, but euro dollar just means any dollars being traded outside of the U.S. It could be anywhere in the world. It doesn't necessarily mean with U.S. banks, but the derivative markets in Europe, they're playing the derivative markets too. They need U.S. treasuries as collateral. And unlike U.S. banks, they can't go to the Fed and get those, that collateral, those T-bills or bonds on the cheap. They have to bid for them. So they need dollars. So if the dollar gets too strong, then euro dollar, euro dollar banks like Credit Suisse or Deutsche Bank, et cetera, the big banks overseas where I'm at, from my perspective, well, they're in trouble. Then they have to either delever or default on their derivative books. And that could create an unwinding, which is far greater than we just saw in 2008 or certainly on August 5th. And I think the carry trade of the yen being too strong for the markets to swallow, well, that's certainly a true headline, but the, the hidden headline, the hidden shark fins beneath these very debt-driven bloody waters is a carry trade in the US dollar. It is the world reserve currency. It is expensive. When it becomes too expensive, uh, or if, if we stay higher for longer under the Powell policy, that puts a tremendous amount of pressure on the, on the balance sheets of non-US banks that still trade in US dollars and need US treasuries. So again, the Japanese carry trade, the US euro dollar carry trade, these are all different examples of potential needles to hit this debt bubble. And I don't think you can underestimate that. It's not, it's no longer gloom and doom sensational anymore. We're, we're seeing this. And, and, I, and I always have to remind, I'll pause after this, just we have to think of these debt numbers without just glossing over them as abstractions. You know, I was born when we went off the dollar standard. And that's in my short life. I'm not that old yet. I'm getting older. I'm not that old. But in 1971, our debt to GDP was 38%. Today, it's over 122%. When we went off the gold standard, uh, we had $246 billion in public government debt. Today, we have over $35 trillion. These things are extraordinary in the scope and pace and range of that type of debt growth. And so when you're looking at that kind of debt growth, we're talking we went from $17 trillion to $34 trillion in just a decade. 
It took us 220 years to get our first 11 trillion in public debt. And just in the last four years, we've done another 11 trillion. We have $3 trillion twin deficits and we have 190 million trillion in assets and 210 trillion in liabilities. So again, sounds like I'm whipping out stats, but think very carefully about those numbers. These are abstractions to many people. Trillions mean nothing, but these are unsustainable debt levels, which means we have liquidity needs to cover that debt. When that liquidity dries up, and unless we create or fabricate more artificial liquidity, because we're not getting that from GDP, we're not getting that from tax receipts, we're not getting that from manufacturing, which we've outsourced overseas. The American dream, as I said, is now made in China. So if we're not going to get that liquidity naturally through growth and through productivity, we're going to have to fabricate liquidity, which means we're going to have to debase our currency. But again, we can always have liquidity, but there'll always be a loser. The loser will be the, the dollar, the peso, the yen, the Swiss franc, the euro, the, the yuan in, in, in that you measure your wealth by. So this liquidity crisis is real. The debt crisis is real. The derivative euro dollar carry trade US dollar thing is real. And which of these needles, which will cause this liquidity problem uh, and popping of this debt bubble is, is really impossible to foresee. It's usually not the thing you see coming. Although I warned many people, not me, have warned about the Japanese carry trade unwinding for the last 12 months, but it's fun until it's no fun. And yes, for now, the Japanese central bank has pulled back and we've bought ourselves some more time to create more liquidity at the expense of the yen. And eventually we'll do the same thing with the US dollar. So technically, under this new fantasy that we can print or mouse click or liquidify falsely our way out of any crisis, yes, you could argue that we could always find oil for the global financial engine or we could always find oil for the US market engine. But the only way to do that now is to do it with synthetic oil, artificial oil that debases our currency. And that is why debt and liquidity in euro dollar markets and bond markets and stock markets and gold are all tied together because the end game here is going to be debasing the currency through expanding the broad money supply to put that oil in the engine that the world relies on and will quote unquote solve the banking crisis the liquidity crisis at the expense of our underlying currency by which all of us measure our wealth in paper money which is a crown of paper rather than a crown of gold it's going to fail but technically, you can have deficits without tears or markets that never fall if you create enough artificial liquidity and debase your currency. And this is something von Mises, Hemingway, Reinhardt, and Rogoff throughout time, David Hume, have warned. And that's where we're at right now. So going back to your point, August 5th was just another example of a hiccup, a lack of liquidity, and a disaster on a small, a small needle that already created a disaster. We, we walked it back by cutting or promising not to raise r rates. In Japan. But again, look at the US Fed. It's in a conundrum now, too. Does it raise rates? Does it cut rates? How does it fight inflation? Does it admit defeat? So all these things are tied together, Dunnigan. But uh, the real carry trade isn't the Japanese yen, in my mind. The real carry trade is the dollar. The dollar can't be too strong or it unwinds the derivative markets overseas. And that's the perspective I have from being in Germany or in Switzerland or in France and talking to investors and bankers here. Yeah, let's let's look uh, closely at that the weaker dollar because it was interesting during uh, Donald Trump's uh, previous preg presidency when he was early on saying, "Oh, we need a strong dollar, we need a strong dollar," and then after some of his uh, appointed uh, bankers on his cabinet had a, some uh, closed door talks with him, he came out turning around and saying, "Actually, we need a weaker dollar, we need a weaker dollar." Now both he and Kamala Harris, the two front running uh, candidates for president of the United States for the next four years, are both saying we need a weaker dollar and we need lower interest rates. And at one point, Donald Trump was even saying we need negative interest rates. So uh, when you mentioned earlier that the victim of that is the, the yen or the dollar, uh, I wanted to take it all the way down to the, the, the human victims, the, the, the earners, the savers, and the retirees whose futures are being destroyed by the destruction of our currency. And the, everybody else, the middle class that are being taxed, pushed into ar arbitrarily higher tax brackets and, and arbitrarily, uh, having to pay capital gains tax on things that haven't increased in value. It's just nominally because they're de destroying the currency so they can claim, oh, now you sold that thing that hasn't changed at all, but we're going to say because you sold it for more because we destroyed the currency. Now we get a cut of that action. So we're all losing. We're all losing. Um, uh, can you talk to us a little bit about that phenomenon we find ourselves in where we even have leading presidential candidates, actually both of them, saying we need weaker dollar and lower interest rates? And I agree. 
And, and, and I wish uh, Jerome Powell would finally just admit it himself, too, because even even Jenny Yellen and Jenk Sullivan over at the Treasury have just unwound 40 years of strong dollar talk to just confessing we need a weaker dollar. We need negative real rates to inflate our way out of debt, to deal with this debt problem that we just discussed. And again, so I know not everyone in the audience you know, is into the wormy, wonky language of Wall Street. Negative real rates just means we need inflation to, to be higher than the yield on our 10-year or the yield on our bonds. And, and that really means you're basically getting no return then on your bond. So you're, you're, you're admitting defeat. What, what Jerome Powell wants to do is have his cake in it too. He knows we need higher inflation to inflate our way out of debt. He knows we need negative real rates. What the BIS and the Fed do, and I'll say it and I'll say it openly, is they'll just lie about inflation. And, and again, this is not Matt Pipenberg on a soapbox. This is John Williams. This is even Larry Summers, a former Treasury Secretary. We all know that the, the official CPI number is, 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 is just dishonest. It's whatever the Fed says it is, so it's never right, but it's always correct. But we've been, we've been trying to play this game by misreporting inflation. But now when you've got Yellen you know, or you know, Jake Sullivan or, or Trump or, or Harris admitting that we need a weaker dollar, and this is what I've been arguing with Brent Johnson. We can't afford a stronger dollar. The DXY can't go to 150 because it, it hurts us more than anyone else. But it, it hurts us also if we have a weaker dollar because to your point, if, we, if we're going to weaken the dollar, it means we're going to have to lower rates at some point. We, we will. I, I, and I don't know when everyone's talking. I said in January, probably be September. We'll see. Uh, Thomas Hernick at the Fed says, a former Fed of FOMC, who was the president of Kansas City Fed, said that'll happen when we have a banking crisis. And we can talk about banking risk, but we will have to lower rates for one very simple reason, not just all the inflation discussions. It's very simple. Our interest expense on our Uncle Sam's IOU, on our bar tab for spending beyond our means, is going to be $1.7 trillion into, the, into 2025. We simply do not have that money. That's our biggest budget outlay right now. And we don't get that through tax receipts and GDP. If we go higher for longer to fight inflation, to Powell's point, stay with higher for longer, we can't afford our own interest expense without creating more money out of thin air to pay our interest expense. So his war on inflation through higher for longer, ironically, is inherently inflationary. That's the fiscal dominance argument. And what Harris and, 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 and Trump and, and Yellen and, and Jake Sullivan are saying, and many others are saying, look, we're not going to beat inflation. Powell has a human, all too human ego who doesn't want to be the next Arthur Burns or doesn't want to be the guy who couldn't beat inflation. He wants to get to 2% inflation by killing demand, by crushing the consumer, by basically raising rates so high that our bankruptcies, business bankruptcies are up to all 13-year highs, 35% higher than last year. Small businesses, the middle class are getting crushed because he's crushing demand to create deflation, to fight inflation. Well, thank you very much for that solution if you're a, an average citizen in America because that's crushing you. Higher costs of debt, a devalued dollar, higher inflation, higher interest rates. That's the perfect storm for people living month to month, week to week. And so that's how the inflation in Wall Street has not affected the middle class or the working poor, and they're getting crushed by a double whammy. So if we can allow inflation to rip, in other words, admit that we've lost the one inflation, Powell will have to admit that and he'll start reducing rates. My theory is he won't do that until we have a banking crisis or a market crisis. And he won't, he won't do it for political reasons, but I could be wrong on that. But we have to reduce our interest rates simply because of the bond market, Main Street, and most importantly, Uncle Sam can't afford Powell's policies. What they've been doing, though, even though at these five and three quarter rates and staying where they are, our inflation rate, according to Shadow Stats and certainly Larry Summers, is between 11 and 15 percent. It's also very important to remember that the CPI scale and all the tricks they use, the CPI scale is a rate of change, not a price level change. So when we were at 9% and 6% and 4%, that's compounding. That means in the last many years, you've been losing compounding purchasing power on your dollar significantly. Some, some have said 30% in the last five years. So if that's true, if you're making 20% even and you're lucky on the S&P or in NVIDIA or something, you're still losing to actual inflation, that invisible tax that nobody at the Bureau of Labor Statistics or Washington, D.C. want to admit. So as Claude Juncker said, the head of the European Commission, well, we don't like the facts, we lie. I know that sounds dramatic. We're lying about inflation, we're misreporting inflation, and we're saying we're fighting inflation. But as Harris and, and, and Trump both, if they're confessing we need to cut rates, that means we can't beat inflation. We're gonna have to allow inflation. Uh, we'll still misreport it, but we're, we're, we're admitting we've lost the war on inflation. And I think Powell's having a hard time admitting that because the Fed, they're not stupid, but they're always late. They're always behind the curve. I'm not alone in saying that. 
I'd hate to be in their position. By the way, I'd hate to be either Harris or Trump and whoever's going to be in the White House uh, in, 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 in the next year, because I, someone joked the other day, I think it was a brilliant analogy. I wouldn't want to be the captain of the Titanic after we hit the iceberg. Because there's really, there's no solution now in the next four years, whoever is in there. And I've been very flippant by saying it could be Santa Claus or Papa Smurf or Albert Einstein or, you know, Nobel Prize economist. We can't fix this in four years, no matter what, whether we stay higher for longer, whether we raise rates or lower rates, we can have a very disinflationary recession or a very deflationary market correction, mean reversion. But we're going to ultimately have to create so much synthetic liquidity, liquidity, and I, in other words, mouse click money to support our bond market and keep rates controlled and keep markets from completely tanking. And uh, that, you know, unfortunately, it's it's inflate or die, and we can still have a very disinflationary moment. But the end game will be, I call it, you know, QE to the moon. I don't see any other way around that. Uh, some people have argued well, the other way around that is some global reset or global war. And again, I guess that's true. Those are possibilities. I don't know how we'll do a global reset when the G7 doesn't get along with the BRICS nations and the East and the West are now very divided. There are possibilities, but I think we'll save the quote unquote system at the expense of the currency. And of course, that is a, a you know, direct bridge into conversation on gold that we've been having for years. And so far, without being pompous, we've been right about uh, the dollar uh, the de-dollarization themes, the devaluation of the dollar, the, the base from the dollar necessary to cover unsustainable debts. And uh, the, the conversation, of course, then goes to gold, which is uh, a, now a tier one asset under the BIS right here in Switzerland. It's a tier one asset next to the U.S. Treasury because it's hold, it holds its value better than a U.S. Treasury. And so even the BIS has admitted, doing again what you and I and, and everyone else have been talking about for years, this dollar is unsustainable and this debt is unsustainable. And the only way out of it is to debase it as every country throughout history, every empire, nation, monarchy, democracy, oligarchy has done at every turning point at the end of a, of a, of a cycle of an empire or a nation, they debase their currency to uh, inflate their way out of debt. And that's always at the expense of the guy in the street, of course. That's what I was going to get to. The ordinary person, we even the term inflation, people understand that as, oh, it looks like prices are going up. But would it be accurate from a common person's understanding to say, to just call it theft, to say this is theft by policy, there, that the, the, the policymakers, those who are in charge of our, of our monetary policy are actually have a 2% target, but it's really a 3.6%, but that's really a lie. It's really 8 per 9%. It's, it's how much of your wealth is being stolen from you that you set aside the fruits of your labor for your own needs and the needs of your children and grandchildren. And there, that's how much is being taken away from you in your terms of your purchasing power on an annual basis. Oh, it's absolutely theft. It's absolutely theft. It's an invisible tax. But think about it. That's the invisible tax, the inflation, which is also misreported, which to me is, is devious. It's devious to misreport, to be dishonest, to not be transparent, to play around with core CPI, CPI, PCI, CPI, you know, all these different names, but they're just not being honest about what the actual real inflation is. When you take on that invisible tax of misreported, underreported by 50% or more inflation, which is killing every dollar you save, and then you add your actual income tax onto that, that's real tax. And then you add on the additional hurdle of of higher expenses the average american's credit card ex interest rate is 22 or 23 percent that's not devious that's immoral so the cost of debt is higher the value of your currency is weaker the inflation is taking more from you and then there's your actual tax bill all of that together means you are barely able to to move as your as your legs are moving forward you're not going anywhere as i say running uphill and roller skates Again, this is not sensational. Now, if you're in the top 1% or the top 10%, that's annoying. If you're in that completely ignored middle class, which was decimated by the Fed, in my opinion, and, and they had the audacity to say that monetary policy at the Fed doesn't affect social classes, or, uh, that's simply empirically untrue. It's the biggest wealth inequality in our history. That never ends well for any nation. But, you know, of course, of course, that's affecting the middle class, which is becoming more and more extinct every day. And of course, that also ties directly into social unrest and all the problems in this irreconcilable America, the divided states of America we can talk about. All of these things are tied together. But for the very, very wealthy, inflation, taxation, higher interest or higher debt costs or higher costs of borrowing, that certainly hurts. But for the middle class or the working poor, that's devastating. That means they're out of the game. They're out of the game. 
Yeah, it means you you keep falling faster, falling behind faster and faster, and you can never catch up, and you can never even maintain. Um, what about we've heard from former bank director Alistair McLeod that in the 1929, drawing parallels between the, the state we find ourselves in now versus 1929, when uh, there were some initial uh, uh, tumbles in the stock market that got everyone's attention and uh, actions were taken by those in charge. As you were saying, you're not you're not envying anybody who's going to be at the helm of this ship, uh, but that that was able to sort of paper over and restore some some calm, some quiescence just for a few months. And then within a few quarters, the real declines began up to 90% from that point on down. Do you foresee that even if uh, some emergency actions, emergency rate cut, this and that, emergency liquidity injections, blah, 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 are taken over the next few quarters, that it may instill a, a, a hope for calm or that now that'll be, that'll be, get us past that crisis. But in fact, it won't be able to fundamentally change. As you said, you can't fix the real underlying problem and we're still going to see a, a bitter end to this system that's uh, well past its uh, natural life. Yeah. Yeah, Alistair is uh, very, very wise uh, in the, in the inner, inner, inner mechanizations of the U.S. or global banking system. Uh, and I think there are a lot of parallels you can draw to that the roaring 20s in the current era, especially when you see a market driven like an S&P, which is a tech ETF where you know 20% of its market cap is in three names or a NASDAQ where 30% or 50% of its market cap is in 10 names. That's very familiar to this bacchanalia period of the roaring 20s where the 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 markets peaked before they tanked. And then even after they tanked, they rebounded, and rebounded, and then they slowly really went overboard. You can see the similar parallels in the NASDAQ in the, during the dot-com bubble. You could certainly see those parallels in 89 in Tokyo before the Nikkei crash. So there's a lot of parallels to my prior point Theoretically, under modern monetary theory, you could say even if markets tank to a mean reversion of 80%, the Fed could just monetize and nationalize the markets by printing enough trillions to pop it back up. But again, that's at the expense of the purchasing power of your dollar. I think um, the conversation on banking risk, I mean, what, in 2023 wasn't that long ago. We had four of the three of the four largest bank failures in America. We had Signature uh svb first republic and then credit suisse of course imploded that had to effectively be nationalized uh 2024 with commercial real estate it was i think it was union uh new york community bank i mean they had net their their non-performing loans were higher than their loss reserves you know these these were these were risks that again don't really make the headlines that's the lie of omission under the current kind of media and political environment we live in you don't know where to get your data it's this BCOM carry on. So this banking risk, you could argue, is the pessimism of a, you know, a sound money advocate out of Switzerland who has a very strong bias towards gold. But you can talk to even the old Fed. Again, I mentioned Thomas Hernig. I really admire him because he's one of the few FOMC officials who has integrity. And when he became president of the Kansas City Fed, his mentor said, Tom, when you come in here, make decisions for the long term and let the short term take care of itself. And what he has said is that his Fed, the one he vetoed every chance he could get from Bernanke on, has done just the opposite. They were thinking only short term, the next generation be damned, in a sense, which was really selfish and political. But what's more important, what more interesting about Hernig is before he was the president of the FOMC or the, of the Kansas City Fed, he was a banking expert in the FDIC and he's a banking regulator. He understood banking risk. And he said right now, if you were looking at the U.S. banking system, I just mentioned the European banking system is highly vulnerable to the jet, to the dollar carry trade and a rising dollar. But what he said is, you know, American banks, we are just one crisis away, one banking crisis away from full on QE to the moon because we, the way he looks at banks, I mean, you've got at 600 billion of these two big, the two big to fail banks have over 600 billion uh, in unrealized losses in their treasury holdings alone, just that. And then trillions more in other investments that are lost under the higher for longer policy, because the higher for longer policy has crushed a lot of commercial real estate loans. So we're looking at trillions of, of potential losses on our two big to fail banks that took us through this, this movie before in 2008. And yet they've gotten away with it for another generation, it almost seems. But he says, and he's a, he's a former Fed president, and he is a former banking expert. So it's not a gold bug, cynical, cynical guy out of Zurich saying this. He said, it's nonsense how American banks are having this conversation about risk-weighted return. They've got 14% of risk-weighted capital on their books to protect them. He says the real ratio is capital to total assets, and that's about 7%. 
And in the banking world, that is extremely thin margin of error. So if we have any kind of real hiccup in the economy or in the markets, or even with rates, these banks are skating on, they're, they're driving up bulldozer on very thin ice. And we know what will happen. A BTFP-like solution will happen because no politician, central banker, or, 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 or commercial banker who's paid on share prices can allow a too big, fail, too big to fail system to collapse. They are too big to fail, but they're too stupid to succeed because the only way to fix this problem is to create enough of that oil for the engine again. But that oil is getting thinner and thinner and whiter and whiter and wetter and wetter, and it has less and less purchasing power. And that will certainly affect the middle class the most because they're going to get stolen from again and again. And again, whether you can afford a half an ounce, a gram or whatever of gold, some people will go way out in that risk branch for Bitcoin thinking that's an alternative. And we don't have time to get into it. And we should at some point have a discussion on it. I think that's really risky. It's not a store of value. I'll remind that the BIS has not made Bitcoin a tier one asset. I'll remind that the oil trade is not going to be in Bitcoin. It's moving towards the dollar. I'll remind that central banks are not repatriating Bitcoin. They're repatriating gold, 30 nations in the last year and a half, which Andy Sheckman's done a great job of explaining. I'll remind that, you know, that the, the China and Russia are net settling in gold and not Bitcoin, and that's scalable throughout the BRICS. So again, it's not to make fun of the Bitcoin speculation. When you're, when you're out in the rain, you'll try to get any car to get out of the stress. And I think Bitcoin is very seductive. But let's be honest, I hate to say it, but the central bankers, as much as I don't like them, they're not stupid. And there's a reason that the central banks since 2014 are net stacking gold and net dumping US dollars and treasuries. And there's a reason the BIS has just declared gold a tier one asset last year. And there's a reason why China and Russia are net settling their oil trade in gold. There's a reason why Saudi Arabia and the UAE just joined the BRICS and are starting to make more and more deals in the oil trade outside of the US dollar. I'm not making this up. This is real. It's not the end of the petrodollar. It's not the end of the US dollar, but the dollar is going to be repriced because of what the BRICS are doing. It's going to be repriced, repriced because of what our banks are going to be doing. It's going to be repriced because of what our economy is. I mean, it's the economy stupid, as they say, but this is a debt-driven economic model now. It's not... The, 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 the airbrush version of America after the war, where we were the world's greatest manufacturer and creditor. Now we're the world's greatest outsourcer and debtor. I'm sorry, we're just not that country that we were in, in the Eisenhower era. And I'm not trying to romanticize, but it was a better America. And now we've got irreconcilable differences in this country. We've got distrust. It's immense in America. And whoever wins in, in 2024 in November, half the country is going to be furious. There's no bridging. There's just distrust. And there is massive wealth inequality, which means resentment. Resentment is never a good thing for the future safety of our country. And you've got guys like Ray Dalio calling a 50% civil war risk. Elon Musk says it's inevitable. I'm not trying to go there and go that dark. But these guys aren't, you know, in their mother's basements doing Google searches. They're not crazy. That's pretty sensational for me. I hope that's wrong. But we all, when I walk through the streets of America, we see how different Venice Beach is or South Chicago or Philly or Minneapolis. Uh, we see it. We see it. And we see in the suburbs, we see what meth has done or, or fentanyl. So it's a different, sad, tragic world. And, and all of this, though, is tied to debt. All this is tied to currencies and central banks. It's hard to believe. It's certainly political. But uh, it's, it's a sin to live beyond your means at such a level and then blame it on something else other than your own policies and then make the middle class suffer the theft and then call that through misreported inflation, the fault of COVID or Putin or global warming when it's just politicians buying time through easy money and taking our debt. Again, remember what I said earlier in 1971, before we decoupled from that golden chaperone, um, you know, we had 246 billion in government debt. But now that we can print as much money as we want, we have seven, we have 35 trillion, 35 trillion, 50 years later, <laughs> from less than 1 trillion to 35 trillion in my lifetime. That is an important thing to reflect on that. What, what, what would that do to a family, a business, a government or an individual who had that much more debt than income? You could live off Visa, MasterCard and Amex flipping around, but eventually you're going to pay the piper or you can steal from somebody else and blame your problems on bad parenting or unfair world. But the reality is, it's because you're living beyond your means. And as a government, our public officials who are supposed to be serving the public are self-serving themselves, getting reelected, even Nobel Prizes in Branke's case, by solving a debt crisis with more debt, paid for with money, literally mouse gets out of thin air, and then dumping the inflation on the citizen 
who feels nothing but resentment right now. And now they're fighting among themselves on every issue under the sun. But the real problem, sadly, despite all the other things, is at ground light, it's, it's economic. Grundsätzlich, as we say in Switzerland, it's fundamentally an economic problem. And history moves on philosophy, it moves on human nature, but primarily it moves on when you haven't had a meal in three days or you can't afford your kids' uh, tuition and you're stressed out. It breaks up families, it breaks up societies, it breaks up governments. And for people who have been uh, getting advice from their traditional retail financial planners or just from their own, uh, uh, I guess, normalcy bias that, you know, you put your deposits in the bank and that's money in the bank and that's what your savings is and that's going to be your nest egg and you put your money in the market and you buy in the dips and you buy and hold and 60-40 bond portfolio. Uh, everything you've described talks about, as you mentioned, a bulldozer driving towards all of that and just crushing it all. Uh, so, for people who need to do differently than what worked in the previous 40 years, the previous two generations could follow a pattern that is not going to be the same going forward. Uh, uh, you have resources for people who are high net worth individuals uh, and how can they reach out to you? Yeah, obviously it's it's a number of issues here. First of all, let's be I don't want to castigate everyone who is in Wall Street or everyone who's a registered investment advisor who's doing their best to help their clients with stocks and bonds. Uh, again, Jeremy Grantham says they're shockingly overvalued stocks, and Jeffrey Goodenlack, who's the bond king, says you'd have to be a moron to buy a bond. They're not beating inflation. So I'm not talking this as a gold bug. But even the best, smartest people whose whole lives are in risk assets, Gunlack in the credit markets, Jeremy Grantham, Ray Dalio in the equity markets. I'm not alone in this. I don't think people or advisors that recommend some diversification are evil. They do believe that tomorrow was relatively the same as yesterday. And Jeremy Siegel had this famous model. If you look at the US markets from 1870, it averages 8%. Just stick it, bite the stick through the dips. Eventually, everything will correct. I don't think it's evil. I think we have to recognize that the problem today isn't a market crisis. It's a currency crisis because it's a debt crisis. So if you're looking for the market to solve a currency crisis, even if you're lucky enough to avoid a mean reversion in the market, well, guys like Jeremy Grantham see it could go down 60, 70% easily. Even if we could avoid that through instant liquidity, even if you avoid a loss, which by the way, all bubbles do pop, but even if you think you can avoid a popping bubble or time that, and that your portfolio, whether it's 60, 40, 70, 30, or even more uh, sexy, if you think you can dance around that, fine. But the real risk is even if your market portfolio return is up 8 or 9% between inflation, actual, not reported, between taxes, and, and between higher interest rates, which again is the inevitability to deal with the amount of debasement that's coming, you're, you're, you're running to stand still. So the only protection is not the only protection, but one key protection and there's art and there's real estate and there's Bitcoin. But for me, it's nature's money. It's God's money. It's as old as time is physical precious metals. And that doesn't mean you have to put 100% or 50% or 80%. And I know if you're, if you're working just to get to groceries this month, I know how hard that is to hear. Let's be very clear. My clientele are very high net worth individuals. So it's, it's a solution for them. If they want to put 10% into gold and that's 5 million, that's 10% of their wealth. Obviously, they're doing pretty well. And for people that are trying to get through uh, the month, you know, four hundred thousand dollars or five million to me in my vault or our vault is not an option for them. But the information I'm giving you is an option for you to look at. You still can get educated. You can be cynical too about gold. You should do your research on gold. But if what we're facing, to me, empirically, undeniably, from all the reasons we've talked about, from the BIS to the BRICS to the tier one asset status and the new reserve status of, of gold at the central banks in the East, and my 30 countries are repatriating their gold out of the COMEX and the LBMA markets, it's because the world does see a currency crisis, not the end of the dollar, but a repricing of the dollar. If you're in a dollar-based system or a, or a euro-based system or a British pound sterling-based system, you have to protect your currency. And Egon and I have been saying this like many others, Andy and many others, you need insurance for your dying currency. And, and precious metals, whatever you think of other alternatives like Bitcoin, which has a massive uh, uh, volatility. I mean, gold has the best sharp, ma sharp ratio macro in the world. It's much more stable. It won't make you rich. It will, it will prevent you from getting poor. 
And I, and I use a simple reminder. I don't know if I used it with your son or with you last time, but again, think very simply if, if this is all complex and all this BIS, TGA, reverse repo, interest rate, interest expense, but that all sounds confusing and gold outperforming, which it has the stock market in the last 24 years, it's certainly outperformed the treasury market. But regardless of that, and regardless of the reserve status, regardless of the, even the BIS and the IMF for admitting that gold is a better asset than the US dollar and US treasury, even if you don't believe them or me, keep it simple, stupid. In 1920, when gold was $20 an ounce, the average price of a house was $5,000. Now, talk about inflation. Now, the average house is $500,000. But in 1920, if you had a shoebox of 250 ounces of gold at $20 an ounce, you could buy that $5,000 house, right? Just a shoebox with little gold ounces. If you fast forward to 2024, when gold's at $2,300 or $2,400 an ounce, and you took a shoebox of $5,000 in cash that your grandmother used to buy that house in 1920, that wouldn't pay for anything. That wouldn't buy you a house. But if you kept that exact same shoebox with those same 250 ounces of gold at the current gold price, you could still buy a $500,000 house. That's how you preserve your wealth. That's how you're still able to function in a world of currency destruction. And that is a simple example. It, you can pick your statistical window where gold doesn't outperform the S&P or the treasuries. But in general, what gold does that the dollar cannot do is hold its value over time. So when you are getting robbed by inflation, when you are getting robbed by higher interest rates, when you are getting robbed by balloon prices in real estate, where your salary does not compete with the CPI, if you own gold instead of dollars, you can still afford to do the things that your dollars was once, was once able to do. And again, Egon has, has a story where you know Yugoslavia had hyperinflation in the 1990s. We were at a, he was at a restaurant in Chino in the Swiss Alps, or in the Alps in Europe. And a waiter said, I recognize you, Egon. You're the man who got me to buy gold. So when Yugoslavia tanked, he started buying gold. He had gold instead of Yugoslavian currency. He was able to get out and open a restaurant in Europe because he measured his wealth. He stored his wealth in gold and he spent in liquidity and paper money. And again, that, those are two anecdotes, but they're simple, stupid examples. No, gold will not make you a millionaire. But if you have a couple hundred thousand or a hundred thousand or 10,000 and you want to protect its purchasing power, you have to allocate that to physical precious metals because 10 years from now, 20 years from now, I don't know what the gold price will be, but I know one thing, that gold will buy more for you than the dollars you spend on it today. That gold stores its value more than dollars. And so to your question, what can anyone do, whether they're millionaires or whether they're, they're barely getting by, um, you can still do your best. I know the premiums are going to be higher at retail levels or whatever, but you have certain services that are better. You can still put a little aside every month. If uh, Maybe you can't, but if you can, even the smallest amount that you can start stacking your own gold to just ensure your own, your own paper money or your salary or your returns. And, uh, you know, I know we sound like we're just selling our book. Of course, we're selling our book. We're selling our, our bias, but it's a bias that's honest and it's conviction. And, and, I, and I welcome anyone, you know, certainly you can get more return on Bitcoin than gold, depending on when you pick and choose. Um, and I am not here to mock that, but there is a lot of risk there too. And, and, and do your own homework on that. But gold, I don't lose sleep on. Bitcoin, you could make you rich or it could make you a fool. I, we'd have to have a whole separate conversation about that. But I think gold um, throughout history has proven it gets the last laugh over broken regimes, broken currencies, and broken nations. And let's be honest, America is broke. It's not the end of America. It's not the end of the dollar. It's going to be repriced. Whoever wins in November is going to upset half the population. We have problems ahead. It's not going to be one smoldering ghost town, but let's not kid ourselves. We have a currency crisis. We have a debt crisis. We have a political crisis. We have a social crisis. Gold is breaking away from all correlations because gold is at least one very simple answer to this problem. And to your other question, 60-40 portfolios, be very careful. Even if they go up, which I don't think they will because I think they're correlated, even if they go up, you're still measuring your return in fiat money, which buys you less and less. So, And uh, one last question again, if people want to follow you or find out how you, your company may be able to help them if they have the correct uh, net worth. Sure. Well, yes, uh, we're Von Greyers, uh, dot gold or VG.gold. Uh, we named it after our founder, Egon Von Greyers, who's kind of an icon in the space. Yes, our minimums are very high, 400,000 for our vaults in Singapore and Zurich and half a million, or excuse me, 5 million uh, Swiss dollar, US dollar equivalent gold investments for our Swiss Alp vault, which is the largest, safest vault in the world. So our minimums in Singapore and Zurich are 400,000, 5 million in the Swiss Alps. That's obviously a unique buying group very sophisticated, high net worth investors. But even for those who can't afford our minimums, um, our website has a lot of 
information on why you should look at gold and more importantly, how you should own gold and how you should not own gold. And one thing we really recommend is you don't own your gold, whatever your wealth in a commercial bank for a number of reasons. We don't recommend you hold it in an ETF. We really do recommend the physical and we talk about those options and we also talk about jurisdictions. But there's a lot of free information just on why gold and how to own gold. And obviously, if you've got uh, the minimums to hold in a jurisdiction like Singapore, in particular Switzerland, we have we have the, the greatest vault and more importantly, the greatest service behind that vault uh, in the world. And you can see us at uh, vg.gold or vongreyers.gold. We've always been grateful for your presence here with us, Matthew, and uh, this is no exception. We look forward to our next visits here together. Thanks for joining us on Liberty and Finance. My pleasure, Dunnigan. This is Kaiser Johnson with Liberty and Finance, and these are the Miles Franklin Weekly Specials for August 13th through August 19th, 2024, while supplies last. First, we feature the famous one-ounce gold Krugerrand at just $60 over spot. Next, we have the favorite bullion coin of Europe, backdated silver Philharmonics at just $3.10 over spot. And finally, we have one ounce platinum Canadian maples at only $80 over spot, one of the lowest premiums on platinum we've seen in a long time. To order our specials or any of the many other options we have available, call us at 1-888-81-LIBERTY. That's 1-888-815-4237. We're available after hours and on weekends, and we look forward to speaking with you.